All right, so um, we'll go ahead and get started for this afternoon. So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming back from lunch and joining me. I think uh, last year I had the same slot after lunch, so it's, sometimes I know it's, it's tough. You had that, that good food, and then there's that uh, kind of relaxing time. Um, but hopefully I've got some interesting things to, to share with you all to kind of keep everybody uh, alive and awake this afternoon. So my name is Heidi Crawford, and I'm a data dissemination specialist with the Census Bureau. And basically what we do is we work with the data and tools, and we're a resource um, here for you if you're working on a project and you have questions about the data or tools, or you're having issues finding something on our website, um, or we also offer um, training free of charge um, to groups and organizations. So I'm a local resource for you. I actually reside in Salem, and I support uh, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. So um, feel free to contact me. We'll have my information at the end, and um, <coughs> stay in touch with me. So for today, what we're going to do is, I've got kind of a little bit of a smorgasbord of um, things to go over this afternoon. So uh, as Charles mentioned, it's an exciting time. We have the ACS data release coming up. Um, we're going to talk about the economic census because this is an economic census year. We have something called the Opportunity Project um, that some of you may or may not be aware of. We'll talk a little bit about that. We also have our Statistics in Schools program. Uh, some of you may know it as Census in Schools. We'll talk about that today. And then we have a uh, new site that we are starting to launch, which is called Census Academy. And that will be a new site for ways for us to provide some different type of um, virtual training for everyone. And then at the end, I hope to hop online for a couple minutes and then show you a couple of these things as well. All right, so we're going to talk about a little bit about the ACS data release. I didn't want to just jump in. I know we have a lot of power users here, a lot of people that use the ACS. So show of hands, how many people use ACS? That's what I thought. But I didn't want to jump in and start talking about ACS if there were some of you that didn't really know much about it. So I thought we'd just do cover a little bit of background um, initially. So um, it is our nation's most current and reliable um, data source for statistics on veterans or um, transportation, employment, and it's a continuously ongoing survey. We conduct the survey to 3.5 million addresses a year, which is about 290,000 a month. We have over 35 topics um, and uh, many different users of our data, whether you're federal or non-federal. And then we provide uh, the estimates um, in annual releases, uh, one year, one year supplemental, and then the five year. So what we're going to talk about today in the next few slides is we're going to talk about this new release that's coming out, and that's the, the one year. All right, so we've already um, had some of the, the data released early. So yesterday was our embargo release. I don't know if anybody in here, sometimes that's for media, but I don't know, Charles, do you have? Okay, so um, if you have uh, sign up for a key and to get access to that, you can get access to the data earlier. And then uh, today is actually a big day as well because a lot of people get excited about the ACS, but today we actually have uh, data releases as well. So we've got our National Income uh, Poverty and Health Insurance Statistics release, and this is the annual release of National Income Poverty and health insurance coverage statistics. The report will include statistics pertaining to the 2017 calendar year and will also compare trends over time. Then we also have our supplemental poverty measure, uh, which is an effort to take into account many of the government programs designed to assist low-income families and individuals that were not included in the current official poverty measure. The report will include statistics pertaining to the 2017 calendar year um, and will also compare trends over time. And then lastly, we have our health insurance coverage. Um, and that is, uh, will include national level statistics from the 2018 annual social and economic supplement uh, to the current population survey. 
and some national and state level statistics from our American Community Survey. And it will include data for the 2017 calendar year and then compare with previous years. So this is the one that everybody's been really excited at, um, about. So as Charles mentioned, uh, so at 12.01 uh, Eastern Standard Time or 9.01 Pacific, the data will, um, will be released. So instead of watching Netflix tonight, you might be able to <laughs> want to hop on and go ahead and get yourself um, early access to that, go ahead and get that ACS data. So this will be our one-year release, which is going to be for the population of 65,000 or more. And we're going to have a press kit. Um, it'll include detailed and summary tables, uh, ACS data tools, state and metro area graphics, and some subject matter um, pre-recorded sound bites. And uh, the news release and the sound bites will be available in both English and Spanish. And so that is the, the first URL is access to that press kit. And then we're also going to have some infographics and visualizations. And we'll be releasing several of these, um, two which will go live on September 13th. These visualization, visualizations will allow you to explore data for over 10 topics, ranging from computer and internet access to employment status to commuting to work. And these uh, visualizations will provide interactive maps, narratives for selected topics. So these are the URL to go ahead and access both the press kit and those visualizations. All right, so um, the next few slides, we're going to talk about some of the changes to the, the release. Um, so first, I just want to ask, did anybody go online last week and watch the webinar. Um, there was a webinar, so a few of you might have, uh, that we did, okay. So one of the new changes that we have are for our group quarters. Um, there's gonna be 55 new detailed tables and two new subject tables um, that were added for group quarters. Some of the previous tables displayed a number, limited number of characteristics for the group quarters population. And in addition, only three major types of group quarters were displayed. So those were correctional facilities, um, nursing facilities, and student housing. So with our table S2602, um, this will allow data users to examine a wide variety of characteristics to the group quarters population uh, beyond age or sex, including disability status, edu educational attainment, and earnings. This table focuses on three major types, the three major types shown in previous years. And then we've got our table S2603, uh, which will also provide information about characteristics for the two new types. And those two new types are gonna be the juvenile facilities and also military quarters. In addition to the other three types of the group quarters, so the adult, the nursing, and the, the student housing. And then also for new tables, we've got some new tables for our citizen voting age population. So we've got a table um, that'll be for, we've got our, the age, um, we've got our educational attainment, our poverty, poverty status, and then also our median income. And then we've also got um, table, let's see our S2901 table, which will include breakouts by race, ethnicity, and sex. So these tables are now included in the annual re release in response to high demand from both our internal and our external customers. So that's why it's important when we do say, give us feedback, we really do take into account a lot of your feedback. So um, because of the, a lot of people ask for that, we do have these new tables. So some of the noteworthy data product modifications that we have. Um, so for tables for six topics of the ACS head changes, and the details are listed at this URL at the bottom, but just to name a couple of them, we had income and earnings. So we have two new tables um, to provide more information about the number of earners in the family, as well as median earning for full-time workers. And then for health insurance, there's a new table that shows health insurance by three type of living arrangements. We have living married couple families, we have living in other families, 
and then living in non-family households and other living arrangements. But all these different changes um, we've got located here, so if I went quickly, uh, we've got these documented for you. So in talking about the, the ACS data, I know that um, one of the things that Nick and I had talked about some with is the API. So I wanted to mention that for um, some of you that use the ACS data a lot. How many of, the, of you in here use the API to get your data? A few people. How many of you have thought about it or would be interested in the API? Okay, this is great. So these next couple slides are gonna talk about this just a little bit. So what we have with our, uh, our API, so on this slide we provided the link to the URL where you can access uh, the API. And then we also have here a URL for a training presentation that we did. I don't know if anybody saw it back in June. Uh, Tammy Anderson, actually, that was here, and um, Tyson Weister, uh, one of the folks that you probably, if you've seen our webinars, that does a lot with ACS. So the two of them collaborated to put together a really good uh, webinar on the API, and they took a lot of the suggestions from the previous pre presentations and had more hands-on examples to show you. So if you're, since I see several of you that are interested, um, if you haven't looked at that, look at this. Um, and these slides are gonna be provided to Charles, so you'll have access to all these URLs, but I really recommend that you have a look at this. Um, but basically, what we do is we offer the API. It's a data service that enables uh, researchers, software developers, and folks like yourselves um, to access the data, and we present it in a standardized way. And then this, with this next slide, uh, I listed out, this is just a small smattering of all the data sets that we have. So um, because with the ACS release, we'll, we do have some of the ACS past years. We will have the new ACS data that's coming out. We'll release that as well. Then the URLs here um, provide you to um, a link to where you can go to access some of the data. And then that second link is really where you can get to all these data sets. And so I was up there looking around yesterday and preparation for this and we have 310 data sets up there. So when you look, it'll start with, we've got some data sets from the 80s and then it goes all the way down to um, some of the, the newest vintage, but we have a lot of different data sets up there for you. All right, so we have um, coming up, of course we've got our one year and then we'll also have uh, other ACS data releases coming up within the, the rest of the year and into next year. So one of the other big releases that we'll have is our five-year estimates, and that will be in the December timeframe. Um, just like with the one year, we will have the embargo period, so if you do have access or want access early, um, sign up to get that embargo, and then you'll have access early. So we'll do another webinar just like we did with the one year for the five-year as well. And then for those of you who uses PUMS, I, I knew that I could look in this section over here. <laughs> okay, so we've got a quite a few PUMS users too. So we'll have that data coming out as well later in the year and earlier next year. We wanna hear about how you're using our data. Has anybody ever gone up to the ACS Share Your Story or did they even know that we were collecting stories. I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. So um, we want to hear about how you're using your data. Did you use the data to help you make a big decision in your project? Did you use it to help your community? Um, did you use it to help expand a business? However you're using your da the data, we want to hear from you so that we can share your story with all the other people that are interested in the uses and it just may spark an idea for somebody else who um, wants to learn and come up with other ideas. So please check our story out, please share your story and please feel free to share this link with, you, um, with people that you work with that you know that use our data. So we're gonna switch gears into uh, our economic census. So every 10 years we do a census of population and then every five years we do an economic census. So typically we do the census, economic census on the years ending in two and seven. Um, 
this year it's a little bit different um, for a couple of different reasons. We ended up starting uh, this year in 2018. So one of the biggest changes that we have for the economic census is we're not doing it on paper. It is all online. And I actually learning yesterday uh, from a, a session that I was sitting in on, they said that the tool is, um, has been a challenge um, technologically. There has been some challenges, but also it's a really good tool because it has a built-in system of checks and balances. So if you put in um, something, it may know based on your answer that you may have reported it incorrectly and it will let you know. So those are some, some positives. We are still currently conducting and collecting information. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in the slides, but even though you may see on some things that it was a June 12th due date, we are continuing to collect, and that's a, a message that I want you all to, to help us with, get out to people, um, if you work with people that are working on the census, economic census. In terms of the information that's required, uh, so we look at, um, employer and identification, uh, primary business activity, sales, receipts, revenue. Um, then we have some industry specific questions and we have 200 unique variables that are being collected per industry for the economic census. And then in terms of response. So as I mentioned, uh, we launched in um, May 18, and then the deadline for response was June 12th. But it is not too late. Uh, what I found out, what the information that I got from our, my econ peers is that we're probably gonna be collecting the data through the end of the year, especially for some of the big businesses that ask for extensions, later extensions anyway. So we really need your help. If you um, work with businesses, talk to businesses, you know, give them a poke. Did you, you know, put in your econ census? Oh no, did you know that there's still time for you to submit it? Um, we even have on our economic census website, we have information. Uh, if you do newsletters, uh, if you're willing to put something out on your website, on the econ website, we have informational guides, brochures, things that you can go and grab um, that you could put in on your website or your newsletters, uh, or if you do some subscriptions. So uh, please help us out. We ask for your, your support in getting the word out so that we can get this information out. In terms of the data that comes from the economic census, so um, it includes data with every two through six digit uh, NAICS code covered by the Census Bureau, but it excludes things like agriculture, educational institutions, uh, postal service, labor unions. And so included in this slide is a complete list of all the exclusions. And then for like the product lines data, we put out um, data such as sales by products. And I know one of the questions that I might get, I knew that Nick would ask me, um, the response rate. So I did try and inquire about the response rate, but uh, econ does a little bit things a little bit different compared to the census. Uh, with census, a lot of times we do the real time reporting of what that response rate is. Uh, with econ, they don't quite do that. Uh, but what I was basically told is that this time, compared to the 2012 econ census, we are behind in every state. So uh, you could see the response rate from 2012, it was 84%, and they are striving for at least that for, for this census. So that's why we could really use your help to, to get the word out. This slide is a little bit, might be tough to see because some of the font might be small, but uh, basically this is a glimpse of the schedule of the products and we provide the URL again so that you can go and look more closely at what the product release will be. But uh, one of the key things to point out is that we'll start releasing products in September of 2019. So about a year away. And in terms of how we'll release some of this information, well, you saw the tool earlier today, um, data.census.gov will be uh, one of the tools that we'll be using. I'm not to say that there might not be others, but I know that um, we have been told that data.census.gov will be one of the tools used to release the economic products and data. All right, so something new that some of you may have not heard of is um, what's called the Opportunity Project. Has anybody in this room heard, of, heard about this? 
So uh, the Opportunity Project was launched in March of 2016 by uh, President Obama, and the goal was to bring government and technologists in the community together to try and come up with tools to create uh, real-world problems. So since its inception, the Opportunity Project has yielded dozens of new digital tools that help meet the needs of communities like finding affordable um, jobs and housing, transportation, um, making driven um, data assessments and decisions for um, economic mobility. And the site invites everybody, you know, we want folks like you, we want um, developers, public corporations to, to come together to come help um, come up with some of these different ideas. And so currently, we have um, several projects that are being worked on now. Um, some of those current projects include a tool for students and parents to promote students' interest in STEM programs. We've got another one matching veterans to apprenticeship programs and then managing uh, grant life cycles. So those are the, some of the projects that are currently going on that we're working on in this, in this latest sprint. So we're currently in that sprint and then we'll actually have a demo day of some of these products at our census headquarters in, in early next year. But I invite you to come check out this website. I know I've been spending time um, over the past few weeks and month kind of going up there and looking at some of the different things that um, have been put together and there's some really neat different tools and, and projects. There might be things that might help you all or spark ideas and things for you. And again, we're looking for your feedback. So if there's something out there that you've wanted to work on that maybe you don't have the funding, you'd like to engage government and uh, we could see about engaging business, those are, we're looking for your ideas. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, another program that um, we're looking to promote some, especially that we'll be looking to promote as we're gearing towards the next census, and that is our Statistics in Schools program. So has anybody heard of this program, or you might have heard of it as Census in Schools? Has anybody heard of this or done anything with this before? Okay, a, a few of you. So Statistics in Schools is a free program. Um, and it's designed to help support teachers' existing lessons plans. And it started out at, as some of you may have recognized it, as census in schools. And we found a reason that we needed to make it more of an evergreen program, so we changed the name to Statistics in Schools. And um, I have a, like a real world example. Of my friend's daughter was a new seventh grade teacher of history in Denver Public Schools. And she was having, you know, new to teaching. So as you know, as teachers, when you're new to teaching or you're starting a new class, it's a lot of work to come up with your lesson plans and, and what you're going to do. So I sent the information to Erica and I said, well, go up and have a look at this site and see if it'll help you. And, and she wrote me back within the week and she's like, oh, I've already come up with some, some new lessons and things that I'm going to do with the, the students. And so I was... Happy to, happy to see a real world example of this. Well, why do we want to use statistics in schools? Um, we want to encourage teachers um, to incorporate some of the different subjects in their lessons plans. And um, we also want to reach out to, um, we've got you know, some future uh, census responders going to school right now. So we also want to try and engage in some of that, that youth and let them know about um, the importance of the census and uh, what's going on and how statistics can be used for um, in school and, and for their projects. And it's all, um, it's all free and accessible to everyone. These are um, some of the grade levels and the subjects that we support. So we have everything, we have elementary, we have middle school, and we also have um, for the high school students as well. So we've got the math, geography, um, and history. And when you go up on that Census in Schools website, um, you ha can see there's a lot of different cool lessons plans that we lay out for you. Because a lot of the lessons plans we have engaged with teachers and former teachers to help us come up with these. 
So here are some of our key messages. I, I do want to talk about uh, 2020 because I'm sure some of you are wondering, might be wondering about that. So we are currently working with our contractor on the plans for um, 2020 and we've put together a work plan. So it hasn't been finalized yet, um, but we're hoping to come out with, um, we we're coming up with ideas for outreach to schools um, and families and classroom and promotional materials as well as kits for administrat ad administrators as well. So we do have those plans in process and we'll be working on those. And one of the things that I want to share is you don't have to be a teacher or a librarian to use statistics in school. Some of you might be parents, some of you might help tutor, some of you might work with um, children. So really this is something that can be used by anybody that's out there and so we invite you if you're interested in statistics. Um, and working with children to come check out these lessons planned. And if you um, teach or you have um, friends that are teachers in the, that you know, please share this information and let them know about it. All right, so our Census Academy, um, this is something um, that's pretty cool and new that we've started. And it is a site um, that will have some new and innovative ways of providing training. So currently what we have on the site, and I hope to get up there and show you a couple things, are what are called data gems. And these are anywhere probably from a minute and a half to three minute um, short videos of showing you how to do something. Um, when you go up there, you might see a familiar face um, that's been on a couple of them. Uh, that we've done a few. And so the plan is right now, we've got a few of these videos and we did a soft launch in June. And then our full launch will be sometime in the fall here, October, November. And what we did with the soft launch is we did what's called a drip campaign. So if you're signed up for our subscribing emails, you might have seen some of these. And we sent one out each week, and one has been going out each week. So some of us recorded some of ours back in November, um, and we've had just people kind of continuously recording uh, these gems. And the goal will be to have a new one sent out um, each week of the year. So if you're looking for something um, and you want to learn quick, we might just have it. In terms of what we're doing for um, SEDSI, um, I know that was something we also talked about um, too, was that uh, we are going to be creating some gems for that. Uh, we're not starting on those yet because as you can see from Tammy's demo, the the system is still fluid, so if we created one, we'd probably have to change it within the next week or two because they are continuing to update. But the plan is to have some data gems for uh, data.census.gov, which will hopefully help everybody uh, get used to the, to the new system. We also plan to put um, some training course modules up there as well. So um, we're looking into that right now. We've been consulting actually with some of the, the SDCs. We're hoping some of the SDCs might be willing to teach a course or two, but we're looking to put courses up there and kind of break them down into a module form. So that'll be something I think that will be new and exciting and interesting for this, this site as well. So I encourage you to go up there. Um, like I said, we'll go online and, and have a look at it in a minute. If you have ideas once you have gone to the site, if you do have ideas, you can feel free to reach out to me or to reach out to Charles and let us know if there's something that you would like to see. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hop up. Um, One of the things that uh, I wanted to mention, I know Charles mentioned this this morning, is this pop-up for the subscriptions. So has it, is anybody get any of our, signed up to get anything? Okay. So I encourage you to sign up. Um, once you go in and you sign up, you will can manage your subscriptions so that you don't get bombarded from everything, all census, if that is not what your interest is. You can go ahead and, um, selectively put in what you'd like to get. But I do recommend, especially as we're coming up with 2020, uh, also just if you're interested in the data releases, certain things, you can um, sign up. So I encourage everybody to do that. But what we're gonna do is, let's see. 
So the Census Academy is kind of a little bit stealth right now. It is not linked off of any website at the moment. But this is the main site. And then what we ha you'll see here is we have what's called the data gem of the week. So this is the one that if you are signed up for our subscriptions and if you um, get signed up for the, the data gems, then you'll see that. Uh, we also tend to post them on social media as well. So you might see it if you follow us on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, or Twitter. So what you have here is the data gem of the week and then there's a list um, just going through. Um, so we've got how do I get business data for my location, um, downloading shape files, congressional district, um, American fact finder, uh, data visualizations. And each one when you click on these is a different gem. And then at the bottom, you'll see a link that says uh, follow Census Academy playlist on YouTube. So we've got all of these listed on YouTube as well. So if you don't want to poke through each one, you can go up to YouTube and then you'll see the, the list of, of all of them. And then eventually you'll see that we've got on the, um, did it go up yet? Yeah. On the, the upper left hand side there, uh, eventually that's where we'll put some of the, the courses and we'll just keep adding to this as we kind of figure out what we want to add. And again, I'm, I'm all ears if there are things that you all would like to see in terms of virtual training that would be helpful to you, please let me know or let Charles know. And then another thing that I want to show um, everybody is under library, we also have um, our America Counts stories. Has, is anybody familiar with these or has anybody read some of these before? Okay. So we started coming out with, oh gosh, I know it's probably been at least a year or so that we've been publishing some of these. And because we do have the release today for the income and poverty, we do actually have some, some new stories that um, came out and popped up this morning. So uh, like this one for income and poverty, poverty, the highest median household income on record. So what we have are different stories that talk about um, our data and, and the different tools and when we crunch the data, looking at some of the different trends and then we come out with some kind of cool and different stories. Um, some of you might be familiar with Andy Haight. He's our census business builder guy. He did a story about uh, data and um, disaster preparedness. So a lot of these stories are written by my, you know, fellow colleagues at headquarters, they may be um, the subject matter expert of something. Um, we've had public information affairs specialists, um, some of the folks that do the job that I do in different states, they've helped with stories. So if you're kind of interested in looking beyond the numbers and kind of see how people use them and the different things, um, different ways that they can affect our lives and how we do our, our work, um, I encourage you to come check out our um, America Account stories. All right, so with that, um, we are just about everywhere on social media. Does anybody follow us on Facebook, Instagram? A few of you, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess maybe I'm biased, I follow us on some of these things. Um, so if you wanna sign up for the subscription, you saw that pop-up box, uh, Charles mentioned this URL earlier. So we've, we've got this that you can sign up. Um, like I said, we're everywhere, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook. So uh, please follow us and um, look for the cool things that, that we're doing. This is uh, my information. So please feel free to uh, reach out at any time. You will have um, the slides with this. Um, call me, uh, email me. Like I said, if you're working on a project and you kind of get stuck and you're not sure where to go, um, let me give me a call. I may not always have the answer, but I typically can find somebody at headquarters um, or a subject matter expert that might, that we can get you pointed in the right direction. And if you are um, working with a set of data or tools and you get stumped, um, 
I know Charles and his team is a great resource for training and I'm available as well to help you all. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank everybody for um, coming back after lunch um, and mm -hmm. spending the afternoon here with us. And do you have any questions about anything that I showed you today? Okay. Well, I will be around. So I do. Oh, I do. yeah, go for it, Charles. Uh, you mentioned the current population survey, and that's uh, it's a fantastic survey. I mean, it's not a very big sample, so you can't get local data. But at the state level, which, I mean, a lot of us here work for state agencies, there is some good data available at state level. And I was recently using the CPS table creator. Have you, you ever used that? No, actually, a coworker recently showed me that because I didn't know about it either. Yeah. Uh, do, we, do we have a minute to take a look at that? Yeah. Uh, Here, come on up. Want me to run it? Yeah, come on up. Okay. Do you want Chrome or I? Uh, either one. Chrome, probably. Okay. Yeah, I, I had a, a question come to me. Somebody wanted to know, like, the number of uh, single people above the age of 50 oh, in Oregon. And it, interest, he, was, he ran trade shows, and he was marketing to those people. And interesting thing about the American Community Survey, there's, there's marital status, but it's, it's sometimes not the best uh, place to get. So slash CPS. And the, the other thing I was curious about is Heidi mentioned the, the uh, uh, ASEC, the S An annual, annual social, social and economic, economic. Uh, supplement. <laughs> uh, so that's, this is the data that came out. Okay. But the, uh, the table creator is, uh, let's see, if you go to data, uh, I would assume it's under data. Uh, data tools, CPS table creator, here we go. So the CPS ASEC goes in a, a lot more detail uh, than, than the, on certain topics, than the American Community Survey. Because as you, employment department people know, especially the CPS is designed to, every, to get the monthly labor force uh, statistics. Uh, but once a year when they do the, the, ACE, the ASEC, why do they call it ASEC if it's A-S-E-S? -E uh, anyway, it's, there's a bunch of data that you can filter here. So for example, if you're looking for uh, single people over 50, uh, you can, you can uh, filter on geography. Uh, okay, age ranges. Yeah, look at all this stuff. Income to poverty, data option. Okay, here we go. Geography, all states. So you have to be careful because it's a small sample. And uh, we filtered on Oregon. And uh, you notice it's got a lot of uh, labor force stuff at the top, like full, part-time, all worker status. So it's really oriented toward that data. But uh, you, can, you can filter on, here we go, this kind of stuff, as you can see. Uh, and it's sometimes a good idea to use a multi multi-year uh, averages, one table showing multi-year average. Because it's a small sample, you can com combine the years and get a, a more reliable estimate. So let's look at three years. And 2018, that's the other thing I wanted to look at, because uh, this data release, it's about the health insurance, et cetera. It was a 2017 calendar year. But I, I was pretty sure that because they do the ASEC on the week of March 12th every year. 
there's already data out for 2018, which is unlike most other sources. So uh, marital status, I think, is, is one of these things. Yep, marital status. Uh, and we can look at uh, we can look at age here, and uh, forgot what this does. Anyway, let's uh, let's run it, see what we get. Get table, and the good thing also you can turn on margins of error. So, because it is a uh, small sample, you got to be careful. Uh, well, this one just has age groups somehow. I messed around and I found more, much more detailed age groups, but statistics, uh, the display unweighted record counts. Well, that'll be helpful if you, uh, maybe that was it. You'd have to, maybe it's not calculating margin of error, but you can see how many unweighted records there are. So if you want to be, uh, uh, okay, yeah, unweighted record count. So there's only, I guess, in Oregon, uh, 7,864 cases. And, oh, and the sums in thousands. So the estimate here is 4,125,000, which sounds about right, 4.1 million people in Oregon. But it's based on a sample of 7,864, so be careful. But, but this is a, a useful tool. I just wanted to, since you mentioned the CPS, I just wanted to promote this. Yeah, you know, I thought it was 95,000 nationally. Yeah, it's there. <laughs> Thousand households. So wonder what that 7,864 was. But anyway, look careful. Oh, three years. That's why. We were combining three years of, of data. And if it's about 1,000 households, it might be 8,000 people, 2.3 2 <laughs> <laughs> times 3, about 8. So yeah, that, that's why you want to combine your, your years to get a better, more reliable estimate. But we were looking at 2016, 17, 18, which would be you know, more up-to-date than the American Community Survey data. And if you're good at math, you can calculate your, your CV and your MOE using that unweighted uh, number of cases. So if uh, I hope everybody is awake after lunch. I know <laughs> it's a dark room, and, and it's uh, I ate a lot for lunch. Maybe you all just went back to your offices and checked your emails since two-thirds of your work within walking distance of here. But uh, next we're going to hear from S Sam Harriet. Harriet? Is that how you pronounce it? Harriet, yeah. Her okay. And, and thank you, Heidi. Yes, thank you. From... Okay, and, and because she's not uh, the Census Bureau, I don't know her <laughs> either, so I'll let her introduce herself. <laughs> I guess that's why when I go and speaking, people ask me to send their bio, send my bio, but I, I, uh, I never know what to say, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Charles. Uh, yes, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam Harriet, and I am the Partnership Specialist for the U.S. Census Bureau. I am based out of Seattle, Washington, and I'm currently covering the state of Oregon as well as Washington. We have heard a lot of really great information about the surveys that the Census Bureau conducts, um, but my presentation today for you all is based on the decennial 2020 census that will be coming up. So this is a general overview. Some of the things in my presentation you might have already heard today or might already know, and if that is the case, it will be refreshers. Um, but we'll take some time at the end. If you do have questions, we will address those at that time. 
So many, if not all of us know why we do a decennial census. The Constitution of the United States mandates that we count everyone living in the United States every 10 years. And the purpose for that is apportionment for Congress. Um, I think everyone in this room knows why the decennial census is important, not only for counting the population of the United States and for the apportionment of Congress, but also because of the federal funding that gets distributed based on decennial census data. Um, it's over $675 billion annually that gets distributed. So it's not only the uh, representation and the power that we get from that representation based on the population of the United States, but also that additional support that comes into our communities to um, really support the efforts in those communities. For those of you with sensitive eyes like myself, I'm sorry for the color things that are happening. It looks a lot prettier on my screen. Um, <laughs> uh, the mission of the 2020 census is to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. Uh, it's going to be a lot more difficult than it sounds, but it will be possible with all of your help. Many of you know about the LUCA program that's been going on over this past year. That is the local update of census addresses. Um, we've been working with state and local governments and different agencies to compare their address lists with our internal address lists to make sure that those are as accurate as possible before going into the 2020 decennial census operations. And that just wrapped up this past summer. So. We're charging ahead. The goals for the 2020 census are to maintain quality of the data, as all of you know how important that is, to reduce the cost of the census. We have the, um, the pleasure and the privilege of working with the same budget that we had in 2010. So we want to make sure that we use that as efficiently as possible to make every dollar go as far as possible. We have four areas of innovation. One of them is efficiency in building an address list. One of the ways that I just mentioned was the LUCA program that we just wrapped up. We have worked on easier ways to respond. This will be the first decennial census where we're going to encourage and it will be an option to respond via the internet. It's really exciting. Um, and I know that other surveys have already had that option, but this will be the first decennial census where we count every single person in the United States and every single person will have the opportunity to respond to that online. Better use of the information that we already have, so we're making sure that our internal address lists are up to date, ready to go, and more efficient field operations. We have, I'm still learning about all the different field operations that we'll have going on during peak operations of the decennial census, but one of those operations is address canvassing. In past decennial censuses, we've address canvassed the entire nation, which is where um, a census worker will go up to a particular block, look up at the or the actual housing units on that block, make sure that the address that they've got on our internal uh, software is accurate to the one that is in front of them on that block. However, for this decennial census, these past couple years, and it's still ongoing, we're using Google Images to compare 2010 images to what they are currently to make sure that um, any large areas that will have to address Canvas can be addressed. So uh, bottom line is that about 30% of the nation will be address Canvas rather than the entire nation to make it more efficient. So the website, the internet option for self-response will go live on 23rd of 2020. The reference day uh, for where folks are living in order to respond to the census though will be April 1st and that's what we call census day. It's the big day you'll, you'll hear about. Um, there's also the option to respond via phone or the classic paper form or a traditional in-person interview where um, a lot of you might remember enumerators that come door to door if you didn't respond initially right away they'll come and do a traditional in-person interview here you will see an example it's really tough to read I apologize um, but this is a little bit of what the 2018 census questionnaire looked like 
We do address rehearsal every decennial census to make sure that the operations from start to finish go smoothly or to figure out what we need to improve on for the actual decennial census. This time around, it happened in Providence, Rhode Island this past summer. So they're just, they just wrapped up everything for that and we should have the results of that test census by the end of this year. The biggest changes from the 2010 census questionnaire and the 2020 census questionnaire are a few things. One of them is that at the end of filling out every individual who lives in a particular household, there will be a question making sure for that person filling it out to double check if they've missed anyone. So that's an important part. Um, there will be a question about if you are of Hispanic origins or not. There is also two different questions rather than one combined question of what is your race and what is your ethnicity. So that will be two part question rather than a combined question as it has been previously. And there will also be a write in option for the race question. So that's also new. Um, you've got another example there. Oops, did I do that? Maybe not, maybe I didn't do that. Okay. Um, so those enumerators that I mentioned before, the folks that are gonna be going door to door to ask people to respond to the survey who didn't right off the bat for that non-response follow-up, each of them are going to have a handheld device, an iPhone, um, and that will allow them to fill out the survey with someone, whoever they knock on the door of. And all of the uh, materials on that iPhone will be able to be translated into Spanish. So if that person is bilingual, they can translate everything right there in their hand into Spanish. If they knock on the door of someone and realize that that individual doesn't speak English or Spanish, they'll have a little language identification card and they'll hold it up and they'll ask the person to point to which language they speak and then at that point they can provide resources for how they can get additional help filling out the survey. On the internet option, there will be a drop down box that will allow you to pick from 12 different languages other than English and that will translate the entire survey into one of those 13 languages. In addition to that, there will be a glossary online and available via phone, and that will take census-specific language and translate it into 59 different languages. Um, in addition to that, we've got Braille, uh, we've got American Sign Language, and uh, I believe that there's about 40 more languages where we will have templates available to different communities that aren't included in this, this selected language list so that community organizations, local governments, and things like that can kind of drag and drop and make custom uh, communication materials. Um, additionally, for the Los Angeles region, we're going to try to hire locally so that we can hire bilingual folks, people who speak uh, particular dialects of languages in certain areas so that those people can get paid to help their neighbors fill out the census survey. Um, all of this is based on census data, how we came up with the 59 different languages. Um, I've got more details on that if you are interested. But I'm sure that you would be able to find that via American Fact Finder and all the other awesome tools you learned about today. <laughs> um, so I am technically based out of the Los Angeles Regional Census Center. The entire nation is split up into six different regions. Our region covers seven different states, as you can see there, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, Nevada, California, and Hawaii. So I, I'm pretty sure we have the largest geography out of the entire nation. Um, year round, we have a regional office that's open in Los Angeles that supports all of the other surveys that we conduct. The regional census center opens every 10 years only to support decennial census operations. So that is the difference between the regional office and the regional census center. In January of next year, 2019, there'll be seven early area census offices opening across the Los Angeles region. So the first one that will be opening up in Oregon will be here in Salem. And that'll cover all the state of Oregon, Hawaii, and some of Southwest Washington.
in July of next year, there'll be a wave two area census offices opening, two of which will be in Oregon. One of them will be in Portland and Eugene. So there'll be two opening up in July of next year. One of the challenges that we face in this decennial census is that the unemployment rate is at 4%. So we are asking all of our partners to get the word out that we're gonna be hiring for temporary census jobs. For each of the area census offices that will be opening, we're gonna be hiring up to 500 people at peak operations. So that includes 40 people in the actual office, 10, about 10 people for management, 30 people for supporting staff, um, anywhere from 150 to 300 people for the address canvassing operation that I talked about. And during peak operations, about 500 enumerators per area census office to go door to door and ask folks to fill out the survey. So um, we, we really need your help. Here's how you can help. If you have any kind of outreach on social media, if you have a web page, if you have a weekly or monthly newsletter, anything like that, we please ask you to share this information. Um, we, we need as much help as we can get. The census.gov forward slash 2020 jobs is specific to the decennial census. So that'll be all of our, those temporary jobs that'll be opening up for the 2020 census. And the, they will be posted on USA Jobs forward slash gov, which is where all the federal jobs are posted. There's also a recruiting hotline if you're interested in calling in to get information. So as a partnership specialist in my role, I'm part of the Community Partnership and Engagement Program, the CPEP program. And what the folks in my department are tasked with is enrolling community partners to help get the word out that the census is coming. Our main message is that it is safe and it's confidential and it's really, really important. We're educating people that the 2020 census is coming, fostering cooperation with the enumerators that are gonna be coming door to door. We're engaging, or excuse me, encouraging community partners to motivate people to self-respond. Um, this is an important part because those partners are the trusted voices in their community. They're the ones that people are going to look to to say, should I open my door to this enumerator that's coming and knocking on my door asking for really personal information. Um, and we're engaging grassroots organizations to reach out to hard to count groups who aren't going to be motivated to respond to the national campaign, which will be starting in 2020. So right now we're doing all this outreach, trying to enlist all these different partners to get ready for the 2020 census. Part of the way that we ask our partners to contribute is by forming complete count committees. That's been our priority uh, for the last couple of years, as well as moving closer to 2020. Right now we are working with state county and city and other local governments to form complete count committees. Um, particularly in those wave one and wave two cities that I talked about earlier. Basically what this does it, is it asks um, the highest elected official in any community to bring together groups of people who have an outreach to hard to count populations and ask them to strategize how they can reach out to those populations and encourage them to self-respond. We've found that the most effective way is to share how the decennial census affects those individuals who are less likely to respond. Why is it important to them? Why should they? How do they benefit from that? So we're also working with uh, tribal governments, state governments, and local governments, as well as community organizations. Uh, committee members are usually experts in uh, government, so local governments, and, and these com complete count committees can overlap. So for instance, uh, the state complete count committee would probably invite other cities and counties to come be a part of their complete count committee and it kind of just trickles down from there. So it can get kind of fuzzy later on when you talk about all the specifics, but um, basically it starts at state, goes down to those local governments and then grassroots organizations. 
uh, these complete count committees might include folks from the media, radio stations, newspapers, uh, social media websites, things like that, folks from the workforce development, uh, small businesses, and then subcommittees including education, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, superintendents, principals, folks from public and private schools, higher education, pre-K, different community organizations, faith-based organizations, and others that are based on the needs of that community. Up here you see some key dates for the decennial census. Uh, the field offices, we just wrapped up the 2018 census test, end-to-end -end census test, and the regional census center opened up earlier this year. The wave one ACO office will be opening up in January of 2019, and then the rest will be opening up in July of next year. If folks are interested in forming complete count committees, we're hoping that those are established and up and running by the middle of next year also, so that they can start implementing their strategy plans. Um, advertising on a national campaign will start January of 2020 or early 2020. Self-response will start March 23rd. The big census day is April 1st, where we are asking our partners to hold some kind of event so folks can come fill out the survey or get help filling out the survey or just get free candy or whatever incentive it might be, right? <laughs> uh, non early non-response follow-up will begin basically as soon as the census self-response begins. Usually that'll be in areas around colleges and universities where we know students are going to be moving away before we can actually get to them with the non-response follow-up main operation. Non-response follow-up will go all the way through till late July and then we'll wrap up the decennial census. The apportionment counts will be delivered to the president on December 31st of 2020 and then redistricting counts will be delivered to each state on March 31st or by March 31st of 2021. Basically at the end of the day we ask that um, you all know how important it is that we get a complete and accurate count please spread that message. A lot of the agencies that you work with already might have already heard from the decennial census team in Los Angeles about forming a complete count committee, or you might have been asked to be a part of someone else's complete count committee. But if you are interested or think that your agency might be interested in participating, I really encourage you to please reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to come back and do a much more in-depth formal training on how to form a complete count committee, what the structure for that should look like, uh, how to even go about starting to strategize. Does anyone in here ever use the Rome application, the regional outreach area mapper? Nobody, man. Okay, so that's a really great tool. Um, actually, I might try to just pull that up here in one second. It, it looks like Google Maps, you type in an address and it'll show you the hard to count populations based on census data. Um, I get really jazzed about it as everyone does here about data, right? Um, so the, the bottom line is the census is safe, it's confidential, and it's really important to fill it out. Um, another thing to note is that every person who works for the census, including myself, we take an oath uh, to never in our, over our entire lifetime, ever release personally identifying information. Um, the penalty for that is five years in federal prison or $250,000 fine. So we've got a lot at stake as far as not releasing that information. Uh, that information, as many of you know, can't be released until the passage of 72 years. So um, it's really safe, it's really important, and confidential. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up that website if that's okay. Um, that Rome application I was talking about. All right, it'll take you to this page. Oh, it doesn't look weird on the screen anymore, that's good. Scroll down, like I said, it kind of looks like Google Maps. Um, 
you can type in a particular address. You can type in a state, a county. It goes all the way down to the census tract. Um, I will type in Salem. Usually, there we go, magic. How often are you guys confused or by uh, people asking Salem like you ask if they're from Massachusetts? Anyway, yeah, I can imagine. Okay, so this pops up. You see General Salem, Oregon. Clicking on any of these census tracts will pull up this nifty little box. You've got total population, medium household income, and a lot of these uh, these qualifiers are hard to count populations. Hard to count populations include veterans, homeless folks, children under the age of five, people with disabilities, renters, Alaska Native American Indian, seasonal farm workers, refugees, folks who speak limited English. So these are all included here and this gives you an idea of when you're forming your complete count committee, the areas that you're going to need to reach out to and who in those areas you might be able to invite to be on your complete count committee. Um, so if you get a chance, go on there, explore. There's also, there's a, a lot of different options you can play around with as far as looking at the census tract and seeing uh, those geographies that the census doesn't necessarily use like city boundaries and, and those really often changing, often changing boundaries, geographies. So uh, go check it out. It's really helpful. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Great, I covered it all. Thank you very much. <laughs> Got a couple of housekeeping things. In case you weren't here in the morning when I mentioned it, uh, we will have a, a YouTube video that on the Employment Department's website that has today's session and in uh, natural color and I know we, maybe we were, we were griping about the color, but I really want to thank the people running everything here at the Employment Department, the audiovisual and the, the live stream. I know it, it, it's a challenge to get everything working right. And so thanks to all our hosts. I wanted to mention something about the embargo that Heidi mentioned. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, it's run by the newsroom, the Communications Department of the Census Bureau, and it's really all about the media. So they they give embargo access to any media people, pretty much. But I think I'm one of only three people in Oregon that isn't in the media that has embargo access, and they really don't like to give it out to anybody, and let, except people who have to like give media interviews, you know, with with. Uh, so whereas Heidi mentioned that you might want to get embargo access, if, if you ask for it, probably they would call me and say, who is this person? You know, why do they need it? So it might not be doable. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. But, uh, but it's only a short wait, <laughs> two days to get the data. And, and I didn't have a slide with my contact info, but I think a lot of you found me when you registered, my email is on there. It's just my last name, which is Reinerson, R-Y-N-E-R-S-O-N, at pdx.edu. And uh, again, big part of my job because of this uh, state data center function, big part of my job is public service. So as you heard me mention a couple of inquiries that I got, I get all kinds of inquiries. <laughs> and. I'm polite even, so even if it's something that's just off the wall, I, I just answer people and say, sorry, we don't have that data, but, <laughs> which is pretty common. But, uh, but if it's census related, if there is a data, I'll uh, find it for you and send you a link or walk you through on the phone, sit in front of your computer, I'll walk you through how to find it, or I'll try to connect you with the right person uh, who does know how to find it because uh, I have quite a contact network around the state and at the Census Bureau. So uh, again, reinerson at pdx.edu or call me at 
725-5157. Uh, I'm usually available and respond pretty quickly. Although hardly anybody uses the phone anymore. It's kind of, I didn't, uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of nice. And oh, and I get my phone messages through email too, so. Uh, okay, well, thanks to everybody. And I hope, uh, hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you come back again when I'll, <laughs> If you didn't, if you didn't register online, send me your email address, and I'll put you on our mailing list for any future events. If you did register online, you're on my my email list, and you'll know about anything else that we're doing. <laughs>